Trade Secrets is brought to you by Ruder Ware, business attorneys for business success, and by the Judd S. Alexander Foundation, supporting quality of life and economic development in Marathon County. Hi, I'm Stuart Etten, president of Ruder Ware Law Firm. Without businesses, communities would not thrive. And without communities, businesses wouldn't, well, have a place to do business. At Ruder Ware Law Firm, we've been providing counsel to Wisconsin business leaders and been a big part of our community for generations. So you could say we know a little bit about what it takes for the two to work together. That's why we're honored to present Trade Secrets here on Wisconsin Eye. It's a new series that shares candid conversations between successful Wisconsin business leaders and lets you, the audience, in on what it takes to cultivate both business and community in our great state. From Ruder Ware, thanks for watching and enjoy the show. One CEO travels to a company to meet another CEO and gets a tour. They talk business, challenges, share stories. Then the host CEO travels to another company, meets the new CEO, gets the tour. They talk business, challenges, share stories. Then we do it all over again. You get the picture. A chain of CEOs traveling around the state, meeting each other, talking business, sharing stories. That's Trade Secrets, CEO to CEO. In 1905, Badger Meter was formed to solve a problem, frozen water meters. Their invention, a frost-proof water meter, began a long history of innovation and problem solving that helped Badger Meter grow to $335 million in annual revenue. Within 13 years of its founding, Badger's annual production had climbed to 10,000 meters and it had expanded into bronze as well as cast iron and had added disc, turbine, and compound water meters to its line. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Badger continued its pursuit of the cutting edge flow measurement technology it had begun in the 1960s. By 1995, Badger had broken the $100 million level in sales and set the goal of reaching $200 million in sales by the turn of the century. In 2001, Rich Musen was named president of Badger Meter and in 2002 was named CEO, presiding over the company at a time of significant growth and change. Sales in 2013 were a record 335 million. Today, Badger Meter has manufacturing facilities in the United States in Wisconsin, Oklahoma, Arizona, as well as facilities outside the United States in Germany, Switzerland, the Czech Republic, and Mexico. Sales of water and related technologies for water applications constitute the majority of Badger Meter's sales. The next generation of metering technology called Advanced Metering Analytics incorporates cellular and fixed network reading capabilities to further increase productivity and revenue. In addition to Rich serving on a variety of not-for-profit boards, in 2008, Rich co-founded the Milwaukee Water Council, which was established in Milwaukee to align the regional freshwater research community and water-related industries to establish the Milwaukee region as the world water hub for water research, economic development, and education. This finished casting is ready to have the critical measuring element installed. This effort resulted in Rich being named by the Harvard Business School Club of Wisconsin as the business leader of the year in 2012. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Trade Secrets. We're here today in Brown Deer, Wisconsin at the global headquarters of Badger Meter. We'll be meeting today with Rich Musen, who is the CEO of Badger Meter, and Catherine Gale, who we met in a previous episode, who is the CEO of Gale Foods. Rich and Catherine are already inside, so let's go meet them. I would imagine your business, the amount of water that goes in your food has to be controlled. 
Absolutely, the amount in our food, and then we use the water in the processing for the heating and cooling. Right. So, and, and so it's, all it's, of that's very important. Yeah, very So when I eat my yogurt in the morning, I don't want it watery. I want it exactly right. And the meter is part of the process to make sure you get that right. Well, what I always say is one, one of the ironic things in the United States is that uh, for 100 years, we've moved water to people. Uh, we've done it with canals, with dams, with everything else. And we've kind of outplayed that game. We're done. We can't really keep doing it. The Colorado River no longer makes it to the, Gulf, the, to the California Gulf. Uh, Rio Grande no longer makes it to the, to the, uh, to the Gulf of Mexico. So it, it's really become a problem. But the real problem is that everybody wants to live where it's sunny and warm. And all the water is where it's cloudy and sometimes cold. We would know a little bit about that where we live. Right. So I believe that the game for the next few decades will start to become moving people back to water. And it will start with the wet industries. If you had your business down in Tucson, mm -hmm. your water would be your number one concern. Okay. But because your business is in Wisconsin, Yes, you're worried about water, but not nearly as much as you're worried about other things because we have water here in Wisconsin. And that's what should happen over time. Wet industries will move back to the water basins. People will follow. One of the neat things about where we are here in Milwaukee is being in the water industry for us, being in the water technology industry, this area is a hub for water technology. Uh, we have the only school of freshwater sciences in the United States right here in Milwaukee at UWM. We have major, major water technology companies here, over 150 water technology companies. And so that gives us a pipeline of talent for people who really want to get into water. Um, a lot of people don't realize the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, which is my alma mater, offers a water business degree. And I can actually hire students. It's the only school in the United States where I can hire students with a degree in the water business. Or you can get any business degree with a water minor. So I can hire a marketing person with a minor in water. You can't get that anywhere else in the United States. So it's a real advantage to us here in Wisconsin. When I travel around the world, people say, oh yes, water technology, Singapore, Israel, Milwaukee. They immediately say it. Now, before the Water Council, people would say, where's Milwaukee? And I'd have to say it's north of Chicago, and then they'd understand. Now I go over, I was in Denmark a couple weeks ago talking to some people about water technology, and they all know Milwaukee. And I was invited there because I'm from Milwaukee and representing the water industry. So tell us a little bit more about the Water Council. It is a not-for-profit, but it's certainly related to your, right. your day job, your, your core business. Right. We started it about six years ago when we brought together these 150 water technology companies. And, uh, and, it, and it, it really has three missions. One of them is to foster economic development in this region around water technology. It's really worked very well. The second one is to foster talent development. But the third one is the most important. And that is with all of these companies and all of this talent, we should be able to help solve the world's water problem. Because a child dies every 20 seconds from lack of fresh water. That's an abomination. And we believe that we have the technologies and the talent and the companies to really help solve that problem. Years ago, the people that worked at Badger Meter, no matter how happy they were working here, may not have been thinking of themselves as stewards or save the Absolutely, world. Right. Are the people that work here now aware right. that it's not just we're measuring the water, but we're doing it and it has an impact in our communities? Over for the good? last decade, we have hammered that message home to all of our employees around the world. And that everybody here at Badger Meter, I don't care if you are answering phones processing payroll or building meters. You know what your job is? You're helping people conserve a very scarce resource. Absolutely. That's, part of your mission. That, that's what our mission is. That's our raison d'etre, to use the French term. That's why we exist. And, and it's important that every employee know this. No matter what their job is, they're helping people uh, conserve a resource. So really it's a shared value company, the idea that yes. you're growing your company by solving yes. one of society's problems. I, I tell my employees a story, and I've learned to tell it in multiple languages because it's so important, and I tell it uh, quite often. And it's a story of a man walking down the street and he sees four bricklayers all working on the same wall. And he says to the first bricklayer, what are you doing? And the first man says, I'm laying bricks. He says, second bricklayer, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a wall. 
he says to the third bricklayer, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a church. And he says to the fourth bricklayer, what are you doing? And the fourth bricklayer says, I'm giving people a place to worship their God. And my argument would be that fourth bricklayer really understands his purpose on life. And that's what I want my employees to do. I want my employees, when you say you're processing accounts payable, what are you doing? The answer is I'm helping people conserve a very scarce resource, water. And that's how you build a corporate culture. You build a culture around a mission, a mission that's important. You know, you've got a very simple mission. You bring healthy food to people. It's very important that people have good, healthy, safe food to eat. So when you, when you think about people who you hire into Badger Meter, what, what sort of things do you look at that are part of your culture here? We want long-term thinkers. We're not interested in hiring people who say, I'll work here for three or four years and then move on. Now some might, but we would like to have people who come in and say, I think I'd like to make a career here. Because we sell long-term products to long-term customers. And if I don't have a workforce that thinks for the long-term, then I'm not matching up with my customer's expectations. I like an engineer to know when they're designing a meter that in 20 years if that meter fails, it's coming back to their desk and they're still gonna be here to deal with the problem. And that causes people to think a little differently. If I've got an employee there who says, I'm here for five years and I'm moving on, they might not care if that meter's gonna last 20 years. That's what's so important to us. I'm interested how you screen for those characteristics in your employee pool? Well, I personally meet with every new employee. Uh, I, I sit down for half an hour and I'm talking Before? about... No, this, this is after they're hired, but 1,500 employees around the world, I travel around and I sit down with every new employee. And I talk to them for about a half an hour about our culture and what we're trying to do. What sort of advice might you have for young people who are making their way in the world and who are thinking about uh, a career. I spend a lot of time uh, speaking to college classes, and so I do get that question a lot. And my number one answer to that is that um, th these young people have to understand that their career is a journey, not a destination. When you finish college and get a job, you're not done by any means whatsoever. You're not done learning, you're not done developing, you're not, you're not done with your path. You've got a long ways to go. I still learn every day. and the most important thing they can do is what I call the care and feeding of your network. And that is, you meet a lot of people along the path. And those people can all be a future part of your network. You can help them, they can help you. And you've gotta be thinking about that from day one. And what I tell the kids is, it's not what you know, and it's not who you know. It's what you do for who you know. That's really the key to building a career is doing favors or just doing a good job at what you're, you've been hired to do for the people that you've met along the way so that they will always remember you. That's how you build a career. That's how you build a contact list, a network. That's really the key to success, in my opinion. Catherine, what's your perspective on that question? So I don't, I don't know if we talked about it before. I get asked this question as well. And what I tell people is they want to put themselves in a position to always be solving problems. Yes and that we at our company and any company don't need people to handle things when everything is going well. Right. We don't need people to, you know, who do a good job on the regular normal day. We need people who can find a problem, solve a problem, and that as soon as you're in a position where you look around and you say, I, I see something that could be done better, like you said that there were people here who come up with ideas right. for how to improve the making of your products. That, that is what the world needs, that's what the company needs, and that's how you're going to, head, get, going to get ahead. Just look for problems that need to be solved, something that can be better, and you're going to make a career for yourself. And, and even with the interns who come in, who maybe are given a job processing expense reports, okay, and they might say, well, I have no opportunity for innovation. Yes, you do. If you're going to process 100 expense reports, I'll bet you can be more efficient on number 100 than you were on number one. And, and that's the creativity that you can bring to any job. So switch gears a little bit. When you think about the brand of Badger Meter, maybe talk a little bit about what that brand is, how you protect it, and then I think what also is interesting, how you intend to evolve that brand, say, over the next five years. Badger Meter uh, ha has a 109-year-old brand. 
Uh, and it's, it's very important in our business to have a very strong brand, as I think it is in yours, because when I pull a food product off the shelf, I want to be sure that that food product is, is what I think I'm buying, okay? Correct. Um, and it's the same thing with Badger Meter. So our, our brand after 109 years is, is extremely important. In fact, in North America, we're in an oligopoly. There are only f uh, five water, water meter makers in North America. And that's because there's high barriers to entry. The brand is so important. We're all over 100 years old. We've been around forever. Um, channels are difficult to get into. So, so protecting our brand is incredibly important. How do you protect the brand? Very strict quality control. You, you, you have to make sure that you're not shipping products that are going to give you a blemish in your brand. Uh, automotive companies do recalls. Uh, in the food business, a recall could kill your product line. In my business, the same thing. So we have to make sure that our products are exactly what we say they're going to be. And secondly, the Badger brand has become known as the technology leading brand. I can't sit around on my laurels and wait for my competitors to leapfrog my technology. I have to constantly be innovating to stay ahead of the competitors or else I lose my position in the marketplace and my brand as a technology leader. We were the first company to put a radio on a water meter so that a car driving down the street could read the water meter without ever going into the house. Now that has evolved. We did that about 20 years ago and that has evolved a lot to the point where a few months ago we were the first company to introduce a water meter with a cellular radio on it. A big challenge because water meters in your basement last 20 years. It's 20 years before they come and replace it. And so you're talking about a cellular radio that makes a phone call every day for 20 years without recharging off a little battery. So that, that's really the technology that we've And you're developed. confident that that's ready we, to go? I mean, it's in the market. We, we've got it out there in the field working and we're absolutely confident so in it. So I, I understand how that transmits the information to the utility company, Correct. but what about integrating with the home automation system it, so now I know how much exactly. water I'm using? Is it doing that? And that's why we went to cellular. Because most people have, have uh, gone to fixed networks where it's a dedicated fixed network because they're focused on getting the data to the utility. but both for the homeowner and for the business owner, it's kind of nice if you pull out your cell phone and you look and you say, oh, look how much water my house is using. Or even better, imagine being on a beach in Florida on vacation and getting a text message saying your house just started using more water than it has on average for the last month. I think a pipe might have broken. A pipe might have a broke. Problem. Exactly. Right. So, so those types of alerts. So what we're finding is the utilities, our customers have said to us, we want you to bypass us and get the data directly to the consumer, which is... Because they want an empowered consumer. Right, right. And, and they, the, the water utilities are facing the same thing that the electric utilities have faced in the past, which is they really need to help their customers conserve. And, and if, you, if you say, I'm a water utility manager and my job is to sell water, you're missing the boat. Your job is not to sell water. Your job is to help people meet their water needs. There's two ways to do that. You could sell more water, you could also help them conserve. And that's what we're starting to see. And more and more utilities are, help, are reaching out and helping their customers conserve water. The, the, one of the keys, and one of the things I saw at your plant, is that you have a lot of industrial engineering where you design systems to, uh, to support your products and to assure consistent quality in all of your products and to efficiently manufacture them. That's the same thing here. And I think you'll find in most Wisconsin manufacturing businesses, businesses that make things, um, that's very important. So we have our own in-house industrial engineering group. And everything you see here, all of this equipment, was designed by them. It's been a big impact on productivity, I it's, would It's imagine. a huge impact on productivity and on quality uh, because, because it assures that everything is made exactly the same. So like you, we have a very talented workforce and a very skilled workforce but we also have the technology and the automation to let those employees be as productive as possible. I have a philosophy that if, it, if there is a function that is very important to your customer and we're very good at doing it, we want to keep that function in house. And so one of the functions that we keep in house is the final assembly and test because it is so key to our customer that that final meter be accurate when it goes out. So each meter is tested? E each meter is individually tested. So when he's done assembling them there, the meters go into a bolt driver here because the pressure on the bolts is very important. So he will put a bottom plate on here 
and then it will drive automatically all the bolts in here. If those bolts aren't don't have the right pressure, the meter could leak. Then he will take it over to the to the test station, and each meter will be individually tested for accuracy and for leaks to make sure it's but right. That's an automatic test. It's all automatic, and everything. You place you it on there, though, one by one. Correct. Place it on, you place take it, it on off. The next one. And these are what are these? About tw uh, forty pounds. About forty pounds. So uh -huh. you you can see that um, he doesn't go home and have to work out. He gets his work out here. So I obviously I don't do this. These meters are very important, and each one does get individually tested so that we know exactly how accurate it is when it's shipped to the house. We have a profit motive, we're, we're, we're owned, but we're also good corporate citizens. We also give back to the communities where we work. We're the major supporters of United Way. We're the major supporters of UPAP and, and of, the, of the other organizations that support our community and make it unique. And, and people don't realize that. We support the arts, we support the schools, and it's important to have these companies here. Let me talk about CEOs, because this is, this is an area that I have a concern. Uh, when, I was, when I was a young man in Milwaukee, uh, growing up, the CEOs of the major companies were, to me, they were gods. They were the corporate leaders, they were the community leaders, they were the visionaries. And, and and I, I admired these men. I, I, I just thought they were incredible because they would stand up and take tough positions in, in the community and, and on the media and in the newspapers and give speeches. I'm afraid what's happened over the last several decades, post Enron, is that more and more CEOs are just dropping their heads, staying in their offices, and keeping their mouths shut. And they aren't providing the leadership that they have in the past. Because anytime you stand up and take a position, somebody will criticize you. And they don't want to be criticized. And I feel like we are, Wisconsin is losing out. That we don't have the leaders that we used to have. We need the young executives in, in, in Wisconsin to start taking positions and start being more, more uh, vocal and providing leadership and vision in our communities. And I'm hoping that'll happen because we, we don't see it very often. Catherine, what's your perspective? I bet you have to share a similar view on that. Uh, I would echo that, and I would get more specific about a topic that I think that CEOs should be prepared to, to speak publicly about, and that's the state of governance in our state and in our country, and the abysmal uh, gridlock that happens across the country right now. So, we're not going to stay competitive as a country and be able to create the opportunities for our employees, for our neighbors, for our families with the way that our government is currently working. And so I'm not saying to people that as CEOs, everybody should speak out as a partisan member of a party. I'm suggesting right. that as CEOs who run businesses for an efficient and effective results that we're well positioned to have a say about what's not occurring in our government and the problems that are not getting solved that affect our business environment and therefore affect our ability to provide jobs which is the foundation of what's possible for for everybody here so i think people ceo should be less afraid to take a public position and say that no matter what party they're from that the current state is not working because and, we and all take that position privately. Yes. So let's take it publicly right. and then let's talk about what we can do and what we can ask our employees to do who are voters because it's a situation that has to be solved by voters to demand something different from our elected officials. CEO as community leader is different than CEO as getting into the foundation of our country which was effective governance. Correct. Which, which we were better than every other country in the world. Yes. We were. I agree. And that's what America was built on, and that's in danger. And so for our business environment, and then also just for our own personal responsibility, we should be speaking out about that. And, and, and I think, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing, but we're probably on different sides of the political aisle. That's a good uh, guess. Because you, you worked in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> right. We, right. We are affiliated okay. more closely with different parties. Correct. And I, I'm, pro I'm so far right, I can't drive in London. Okay, so, so we're, we're probably on different sides of the aisle, but one thing that we can agree on, so this isn't coming from one perspective or the other, one thing we can agree on is that we have polarized our people over so many issues, and, and it's, it's almost like a prize fight where everybody goes right to their corners, uh, you know, and, and then comes out fighting again. 
it, it's a real problem. There is common ground. We can find common ground, but we need leaders, non-political leaders, who will stand up and say, let's find that common ground. Right. But the people that we've elected won't get reelected on those long-term solutions. So there's actually a problem in our system right. that exists in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party about who ends up getting elected and what they get rewarded to do. Right. And you and I know as CEOs that the incentives have to match right. what's needed by the organization. The incentives in our political system do not match what we need from our governance. And CEOs should be speaking out about that. I, I agree with you. This has been a fascinating tour. I've enjoyed it, and I've enjoyed meeting you and talking to you. I, I think this is a great idea, the CEO to CEO program. Um, it really gives us an opportunity to see other businesses that we aren't normally exposed to and to meet other people who, amazingly, you would think come from a totally different... I mean, what do sailboats have to do with the food <laughs> industry and have to do with water meters? Uh, and, and, and yet we always find the common issues, common, common concerns, common uh, techniques for addressing those concerns. We find that, that uh, our people are important, our technology is important, we find that our brand is important. We find commonality between these companies. And what we want to make happen in the world and how it's not just about our profits and Correct. loss statement, it's about something bigger than it's that. It's not just about our business, right. Well, to you, Rich, and to you, Catherine, thank you so much for your time and for your candid uh, interaction on this program. We really appreciate it. Thank you, we enjoyed thank you. it. Thanks so thank much. You, Dan. Trade Secrets has been brought to you by the law firm of Ruder Ware and by the Judd S. Alexander Foundation.